Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Doug Elmendorf, the Dean of Harvard Kennedy School. It is my great pleasure to be here with you today. And my pleasure to be presiding over my first commencement as Dean. This is truly a time to celebrate. Tomorrow in this tent, our graduates will receive their diplomas in front of their families, friends, classmates, and the faculty and staff members who have supported them during their time here at the Kennedy School. Today, we are gathered in this tent uh, to hear uh, the wisdom and insight of this year's Harvard Kennedy School commencement speaker, former U.S. Secretary of State, Madeleine Albright. Secretary Albright has had a distinguished career committed to the public good through both her ideas and her actions. From 1997 to 2001, she served as Secretary of State uh, for President Bill Clinton. She was the first woman to hold that position and the highest ranking woman in the U.S. government at that time. Madeleine Albright was born in Prague in 1937. When Czechoslovakia was invaded by the Nazis at the beginning of the Second World War, her family left for the United Kingdom. Uh, and although she and her parents were able to escape, she lost three grandparents in concentration camps during the Holocaust. She later attended Wellesley College and then Columbia University where she earned a certificate in Russian studies and an MA and PhD in public law and government. Madeleine Albright's first position in public service was as a legislative assistant for Senator Edmund Muskie of Maine. She was then hired by one of her former professors, Zbigniew Brzezinski, to work at the National Security Council uh, in the White House in the Carter administration. She later became a professor of the practice of diplomacy at the Georgetown University School of Foreign Service, where she was named Teacher of the Year four times. Then, during Bill Clinton's first term as president, she served as the U.S. Permanent Representative to the United Nations, and during his second term, served as Secretary of State. As Secretary of State, Madeleine Albright worked on a wide range of issues. She fought nuclear proliferation, especially in North Korea. She was the first Secretary of State to visit North Korea. And she once said, and I quote, when trying to solve difficult national issues, it was sometimes necessary to talk to adversaries as well as friends. Historians had a word for this, diplomacy. Secretary Albright played a significant role in the peace mission to the Middle East in 1997, brokering talks between Israel and Arab nations. She was a strong supporter of NATO, helping to expand the organization's membership and to encourage it to intervene during the crisis in Kosovo. She worked with leaders from many nations on behalf of human rights and democracy. It was during these years that she developed her reputation as a pragmatic idealist, as she once described herself. Madeleine Albright has been a longtime advocate for women's rights and women's participation in the political process. She said, quote, the reason I made women's issues central to American foreign policy was not because I was a feminist, but because we know that societies are more stable if women are politically and economically empowered. Secretary Albright also once said, no matter what message you are about to deliver somewhere, whether it is holding out a hand of friendship or making clear that you disapprove of something, the person sitting across the table is a human being. So the goal is to always establish common ground. 
Those words are fitting not only for a Secretary of State, but for anyone interested in pursuing public service, which inevitably involves trying to build relationships in difficult situations. Following her tenure as Secretary of State, Madeleine Albright wrote five New York Times bestsellers, including Madam Secretary, a memoir in 2003, and Memo to the President, How We Can Restore America's Reputation and Leadership in 2008. Secretary Albright currently serves on a wide range of public and private uh, positions, including sitting on the U.S. Department of Defense's Defense, Advisor, uh, Defense Policy Board, a group tasked with providing the Secretary uh, with objective, informed advice about defense issues. In 2012, President Barack Obama awarded Madeleine Albright the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the highest civilian honor in the United States. Thank you. But I don't want to leave you with the impression that Secretary Albright is all work and no fun. I am told that she uh, once lamented never having visited New Zealand because one of her role models, Zena, the warrior princess, was from New Zealand. Uh, she has guest starred on a number of television shows, uh, including Parks and Recreation. And if you, if you watch Parks and Rec, you can see a photograph of her sitting on the credenza uh, behind uh, one of the stars of the show. Uh, like you, I am very excited uh, to hear uh, Madeleine Albright's perspective today. It gives me great honor and pleasure to welcome the 2016 Harvard Kennedy School commencement speaker, former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright. Dean Elmendorf and distinguished officials and faculty of the Kennedy School, family and friends and members of the class of 2016. Uh, congratulations and good afternoon to you all. And Dean Elmendorf, thank you so much for your kind words and your welcome today. I look forward to visiting a lot more. Thank you. Um, it's an honor to share this moment with you and also a great personal pleasure. As a professor, I just love academic surroundings, and as a parent and grandparent, I love commencements. And as a policy wonk, I know I'm treading on hallowed ground. But another reason I'm excited to be here is I have to confess is that I cast my first ballot for president for John Kennedy in Chicago, where it really mattered. Uh, a couple of years before that, I had actually interviewed him at um, for my Wellesley College newspaper. It's a reporter's job to ask tough questions, and I asked Senator Kennedy for his autograph. And that may seem unprofessional, but the answer to a question is just words. An autograph is forever, and I still have JFKs. <laughs> There are many memorials to John Kennedy, but of them all, this school and its graduates contribute the most to his living legacy. So today is a very special occasion, one in which we celebrate you as the leaders of tomorrow and wish you luck in cleaning up the mess left behind the leaders of today. Now, I've given many commencement speeches before, but usually to undergraduates, and in fact, I gave the Harvard commencement address in 1997 when those seniors receiving diplomas tomorrow were still in diapers. To undergraduates, I always speak very personally and, and try to be inspirational. And I urge them to aim high, to go for the gold, to remember what is truly important, and above all, to avoid cliches like the plague. <laughs> Kennedy School graduates are more experienced and mature, and many of you have been out in the real world and already know what it's like. 
That is, after all, why you went back to school. You are also a very diverse and knowledgeable group, and as this great university has recognized in the foreign students it has attracted, the research it conducts, the courses it offers, and the sensibility it conveys, you are preparing to live truly global lives. You will compete in a world marketplace, travel further and more often than any previous generation, and share ideas, tastes, and experiences with counterparts from every culture. You will also learn, if you haven't already, that to have a full and rewarding future, you will have to look outwards, not inwards. And this is important because there are still many in Washington and around our country who think of America as an island. They believe that we are unaffected by events across the far side of the sea. They refuse to accept America's interests are linked to the security and prosperity of allies and friends. And they do not understand that our global leadership carries with it both tangible benefits and enormous responsibilities. We cannot will away or wall away the world. And yet, according to a recent survey by the Pew Research Center, 57% of Americans want the United States to deal with its own problems while letting other countries get along as best they can. What this suggests to me is that we have some educating to do, because America today is embattled on many fronts that require us to work with others. We are threatened by terrorists who cannot be tracked down and defeated without the cooperation of other countries. We worry that the world's most dangerous weapons might fall into the hands of the world's most dangerous people, yet preventing that can only be a multinational enterprise. We have an economy that will grow only if our exports expand, which means that foreign populations must have the means to buy what we sell and that we will only be hurting ourselves if we erect new barriers to trade. And if we are in a battle of ideas with dictators and demagogues who spread lies about what we do and what we intend, we will only be able to deal with the refugee crisis, the greatest humanitarian disaster since World War II, if we cooperate with others and recognize that we must take in more refugees ourselves before we tell everybody else what to do. We have to push back, but we will not be able to do any of this at the same time if we are cutting back on embassies, cutting back on public diplomacy, cutting back on student exchanges, cutting back on assistance, and severing our connections to the world. Some say we can no longer afford to be a global leader, and we do have good reason to be concerned about our country's balance sheet. But as we have learned through history, the best route to fiscal stability is to prevent war, and the quickest path to catastrophe is to allow small problems to grow into big ones. The truth is that no country has a more compelling interest than ours in an international system that truly works to keep the peace, foster development, build free institutions, and establish and enforce the rule of law. And no country has greater reason for pride in its tradition of leadership, a tradition that has been upheld by both ends of the political spectrum. I didn't always agree with George W. Bush, but he was a champion in the global fight against HIV and AIDS, and all Americans should be proud of that. Bill Clinton led the campaign to halt ethnic cleansing and terror in the Balkans. John Kennedy sent forth the finest group of ambassadors America has ever had, Sarge Shriver and the Peace Corps. And more than 30 years ago, Ronald Reagan launched what everyone now describes as a revolution against big government, but he also increased the level of U.S. foreign aid and, with Democratic partners, established the National Endowment for Democracy. I bring up these examples because they reflect the values upon which this school was founded and because I see these values under siege today. More and more, we hear politicians and pundits proclaiming that government is the source of evil, 
and that officials in Washington want nothing more than to deprive citizens of their rights. When I was a child in Europe, as the dean said, my family was driven twice from its home, first by the Nazis and then by the communists. And so I know that power can be abused. But I have to point out that in America, the government is not the enemy. The government is us. No one wants our bureaucracy to be bigger than it needs to be. But neither can anyone deny that our public servants play an essential role in providing security, building infrastructure, ensuring order, protecting the disadvantaged, and safeguarding the health of our people. I should add that when I was Secretary of State, I traveled to many countries that might be considered a libertarian paradise because the hand of government is so weak. In quite a few nations, the governments don't have the resources to provide Social Security or Medicare or electricity or paved roads or clean water or independent courts. That is not my vision of America, and it is not what I want to see in the world. The men and women who founded our country loved freedom, but their purpose in coming together was not to eliminate government, but to create a system of checks and balances that would enable our society to prosper and grow. And for all its shortcomings, the government they conceived should be an obje object of pride for all our citizens, in part because even today it remains a source of admiration and envy across the globe. That status is of special importance in our time because the art of governing has become more and more complicated. A primary reason for this is technological change. We know, of course, that the advance of technology is nothing new. What is different now is the pace. Everything is moving at warp speed. In little more than a generation, billions of previously isolated people have gained access to a vast reservoir of information and to the means for broadcasting their views to a worldwide audience. Technology has brought many amazing opportunities to millions of people who now can imagine and have more productive lives. But technological change is a double-edged sword. In the past, public opinion was filtered through various moderating instruments, such as the mainstream media, centrist political organizations, and the business community. These filters are not as effective today and will be even less so tomorrow. This revolution has enabled almost everyone to be heard on almost every issue, making it harder to achieve consensus and more difficult for anyone, whether a dictator or a Democrat, to govern. You don't have to be a geek to grasp the consequences of this, including its impact on politics. In recent years, we have seen major protests or changes of government across the world, including much of Europe and the Middle East. The outcome of all this unrest has been mixed at best, because it's much easier to demand change than to implement reforms, and far simpler to denounce an imperfect leader than to find a better one. It requires organization and planning and political skill to translate a legitimate desire for new policies into the reality of an effective and accountable government. That combination is found only rarely and seems especially scarce in the world today. In its absence, we are likely to see frequent changes in leadership, confusion about what people really want, widening social divisions, and a buildup of frustration and anger that is directed at those most vulnerable and least responsible for the problems. This is happening today in Europe and the United States, where there is growing apprehension about refugees and migrants, and no shortage of cynical politicians who are exploiting those feelings for their own electoral advantage. But while it's easy to observe politics today and the state of the world and conclude that things are a hopeless mess, that's a diplomatic turn of art, I don't believe that and neither should you. It helps, after all, to put matters into perspective. Years ago, when I first came to the United States, John F. Kennedy was a young congressman and a different generation of Americans faced a broken Europe and a devastated Asia. Overseas, there was a daunting array of dangers, including the communist expansion in Central Europe, 
a Maoist revolution in China, the turbulent partition of India, a desperate clash between Arabs and Jews in the Holy Land, and tensions on the Korean Peninsula that would lead to war. At home, there was talk about the need for bipartisanship, but there was also currents of recrimination and scapegoating that produced the McCarthy era, a period of deep division both within Congress and between Congress and the executive branch. In addition, the nuclear era had just begun, bringing with it a feeling that Armageddon might be just around the corner. I mention this not to depress you further, but to remind us all that democratic institutions are resilient and that problems that appear insoluble often become less uh, over a period of time. All that is required is leadership of the type that John Kennedy was able to provide. For as he once said, the times are too grave, the challenge is too urgent, and the stakes too high to permit the customary passions of political debate. We are not here to curse the darkness, but to light the candle that can guide us through that darkness to a safe and sane future. That is your mission, and that is why public service is so important, and that is why the degree you're earning is so valuable. I mentioned earlier that I had delivered the Harvard commencement address in 1997 during my first months as Secretary of State. The day had special resonance because it was 50 years after Secretary of State George Marshall laid out a vision of how America would help Europe recover from the devastation of World War II. And while two decades have passed, much of what I said on that day is just as relevant, including the following, to quote myself. Today, the greatest danger to America is not some foreign enemy. It is the possibility that we will fail to hear the example of George Marshall's generation, that we will allow the momentum toward democracy to stall, to take for granted the institutions and principles on which our own freedom is based, and forget what history reminds us, that problems abroad, if left unattended, will all too often come home to America. We must once again heed this lesson in 2016, and a new generation, your generation, must treat this as another clarifying moment in our history. Because a decade or two from now, you could be known as neo-isolationists who allowed tyranny and lawlessness to rise again, or those who solidified the global triumph of democratic principles. You could be known as neo-protectionists whose lack of vision produced economic catastrophe, or those who laid the groundwork for rising prosperity around the world. You could be known as the generation that allowed itself to be manipulated by technology, or as the one that harnessed its powers to solve the future's thorniest problems and open the minds of millions to progress. You could be known as world-class ditherers who stood by while the seeds of renewed global conflict were sown, or those that took strong measures to forge alliances, deter aggressions, and keep the peace. There is no certain roadmap to success, either for individuals or for generations. Ultimately, it is a matter of judgment, a question of choice. In making that choice, you must remember that there is not a page of American history of which we are proud that was authored by a chronic complainer or a prophet of despair. We are doers. We have a responsibility, as others have had in theirs, not to be prisoners of history, but to shape history, a responsibility to fill the role of pathfinder and to build with others a global network of purpose and law that will protect our citizens, defend our interests, preserve our values, and bequeath to future generations a legacy as proud as that of George Marshall and John Kennedy. To that mission, I pledge my full support, but success will only come if you summon your best efforts and if you light the candle that guides us to a better future. So I congratulate all of you, and I challenge you, but most of all, I thank you for the opportunity to be here and to tell you we are all counting on you. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you. Thank you.